Uh, so I got a new nickname for the ladies out there on the active roster. All Madden, because y'all be controlling all the players on the field. And you got to watch out for those play action, because uh, they may fake a handoff. But they also might, uh, they also might actually put it right in the belly. And whoop, there she is. Uh, welcome to episode 92 of the Alpha B podcast. And uh, that was actually take two because the first time I forgot the whole aux cord that actually makes you be able to hear this shit. But uh, you don't get two takes when you decide to keep it. Wow, that was a very dark play action abortion joke. Gotta love it. Um, anyways... Well, yeah, episode 92 of the Off and Beat podcast. Typically, I record the episodes a couple days in advance, so I have a couple stacked up for my busy week, but uh, I haven't had time, so this one will actually be coming out the day that I record it, 3.07 a.m. on a Friday, 3.08 now, and this will be your Friday podcast. You're welcome for the consistency and... You know what's beautiful about um, being consistent is that uh, you have excuses to not be inconsistent. Yes, take that for what it's worth. Speaking of worth, uh, earlier today I was uh, taking a walk at the park. And as I was uh, lapping, you know, the park, the concrete... There was no uh, lines, it was actual concrete. Not one of those fake track shit. But anyways, she a track star. But anyways, yeah, I was uh, lapping. And as I was lapping, I found a dollar bill. It was uh, not around the peak times. It was around 1.30pm, so it was pretty uh, bare in comparison. And I grabbed the dollar bill and I thought to myself, Clint... You're better than this. Don't take this dollar. Leave it behind for someone else to find it. Or you know what? Take that dollar bill. Go around and give it to a kid. Or give it to a lonely, depressed person. Because you know, there's nothing more... um, There's nothing more righteous than going up to a person that you assume is depressed, even if they're not, and telling them, hey... I know you hate yourself right now, but I can make you feel better. That's not egotistical at all. I guess you could really say there is ego in wanting to help people. Obviously, help people. Don't not help people. Don't be a piece of shit. But there's no bigger ego. There's no bigger narcissistic thing, ironically, than to be like, you need me. Right now. And you have the greatest of intentions. Hey, it's better to uh, build someone a house and pay off it, pay it off so they will never have to pay another dime on it. And you actually help a family in need if you can. But then there's something about that like, I'm about to make y'all's life fucking great. And no, you don't have to pay me back, but. I'm always going to have that ownership over you, even though technically I literally own it and you literally don't have to pay me anything like a landlord. But there's an ego behind being generous. And it's a shitty fucking world that we have to live in that I even have to think that way. Because you shouldn't have to think that way. But when I had that dollar bill, I kept the dollar bill. You know why? Because all I thought was all the cynical things, like, it's like when people say, it's like when, um, if you're like a billionaire, you have a shitload of money, and people always obligating you, you should donate to charities, you should donate to this, you have this hoarding wealth, right? Just donate it, give it to a bunch of charities. And if I had a shitload of money, 
I wouldn't just donate to charities. I really wouldn't. I would donate to individuals that are affected by causes or I would individually directly impact people's lives, whether that's with money, my time, or whatever. Um, because to be honest, I don't trust a lot of these charities. St. Jude's, you should look into them. Um, they're a lot of, you know, a decent portion of their your donations don't necessarily, it, it's more than others, but like the American Red Cross, very questionable at best. And I'm not saying don't donate charities. I'm just saying, just know that when you donate $5, maybe three is going into actual use. The rest, they got a fund for people that put it together, blah, blah, blah. You know, you know the spill. But I legitimately had this selfish fucking thought that this dollar bill will be better in my hands than some stranger's hand. When they are probably the ones more in need, even though I'm closer to in need than not in need. I guess you could say yes indeed, little baby. And uh, job searches. Oh, Jesus, Clint. Oh, Jesus is about your wants and needs. Uh, I ain't the goat. But I fit the description. It's like, eh, I don't know about that. But by the way, I, I asked... People who as a dude I was working with, he was listening to some music, and it was some little baby shit. And to be honest, a lot of little baby shit kind of sounds similar to me. Don't worry, I'm gonna get back to the point. Don't worry. This little detour, little U-turn, never hurt no one. Even if you do it when it clearly says don't U-turn, and you do it in front of a cop at four o'clock, but it's cool. Um, not my problem. You deserve it, you fucking Saturn. Um. Uh, I guess he didn't like when he saw those rings of lights. Uh, oh, Jesus. Uh, maybe he should have changed it to wings. and But I guess his wings were clipped. Hopefully he doesn't get clipped by that guy. Anyways. But just the fact that I legitimately had the thought that this money is better in my hands. Which, honestly... I really do feel like if I had a shitload of money, the money would be better in my hands where I can individually dictate where it goes to, where it can make direct impacts. Because the problem, my my problem with a lot of these charities, it just goes into a big pot. And they never have to actually, you never actually have to see the results of what they do with it. It's just trust us. It's like, you know, I would actually like to see like uh, me turning in the money Having a tracker on that dollar bill and see which fund it goes to. See, hey, this helped build a house in western Michigan. Who, you know, houses got torn down by tornadoes. Your dollar, your $5 donation contributed to that. It's like, okay, cool. And then you have this nice landscape. You put it on your website to advertise how fucking great you are. Which is kind of weird how people will shit on people for... Filming their own charitable actions, like giving a homeless dude a hundred dollars, or which I'm not a fan of, by the way. But we're okay with these actual charities of broadcasting their charitable uh, attribute attributions. Contribute, con, 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 fuck me. Contribute, contribute. Oh Jesus, Clint. Oh Jesus, you're losing it. Contributions. <laughs> oh, fuck you. I can't. Why? What was I trying to say? Uh, I was trying to say like attributes, but tribulations. But that's not a word. Contributions. Oh, Jesus. i so sorry. You get what I'm trying to say. Eh, just uh, shooting my shot. Um, but yeah. I do. You know, and it sounds selfish because I believe uh, Elon Musk actually. There was a, it's always weird when a charity reaches out to an individual to donate X amount of money to them. Like, that's kind of weird. It's like kind of going up to, imagine you're just at Walmart and you just go up to a guy who's just, uh, you know, trying to get some fishing poles and trying to get some fake tackle bait. And you just go up to him like, hey man, 
I was actually looking at the video game section. I was uh wonder if you could donate three thousand dollars to me. You know, my uh brother recently broke his elbow. And uh he has health insurance, but it's not all the way covered. Just uh wondering if you like to donate. You didn't even do like the whole design of pretending the you know be at a stoplight and pretending you're homeless when your Outback Subaru is literally like uh, 300 feet away, chilling in a Walmart parking lot, and you're pretending to be home. Like you didn't even pretend to put a presentation. I at least, I at least respect when someone puts up a fake presentation, man. You're just going around in a Walmart, and be like, "Hey, I'm gonna donate three thousand dollars us," and then when they say, "Um," You know what? Actually, I just might. But can I uh, actually see a picture of your brother's elbow? It's like, wh- what? You don't trust me? It's like, I don't think trusting this. I don't think asking a stranger, hey, you said your brother broke his elbow. Is your brother here? Or can I at least see a picture of his elbow? Him in a cast. You could fake being in the cast. Do you have a picture of that? And then being mad at the audacity of someone asking, well, how credible is your claim? How credible is your organization? And Elon Musk was essentially like, you know what? I will donate the, I will donate, I think he said like $60 billion or some crazy amount of billions of dollars. It may not, no, it was $6 billion exactly. And he's like, I will donate to you $6 billion. If you show me your bookings of what, of specifically of what your fund and donations actually go to, how much of what is donated can trip. Basically, let me, unlike a Rory Mao, unlike uh, Joe Budden refused to show Rory Mao, let me see the accounting. That's basically Elon Musk is like, you're the one asking me for $6 billion. If you're going to go out of your way to ask me and then try to guilt me, I want to see the numbers. And then if you prove to me that you're credible and the accountant goes to that, then you know what? Because I'm not going to sit here and make some CEO of a charity $100 million richer of my $6 billion because of fees and servicing. Like, go fuck yourself. Like, no. This is going to whatever the fuck the cause is. And the fact that not only did they... Basically not follow up, and they gave this cliche roundabout lawyer answer of, well, you know, we just need to protect the integrity of all this shit. It's like, you want to protect your integrity? Why don't you show the public how real it is? Let's keep it real, and show us how real you are. I really should have looked up the name of this company before I went on a 10-minute rant about it, but hey, fuck it, we're here. That's what she said, except uh, when she said, fuck it, we're here. I said, been there, done that. Um, but yeah, I think, isn't it crazy how when all you asked for was, hey, yeah, I will do exactly what you asked me to do unsolicitedly. I will 100% do it. But can you... Uh, can you show me what I'm working with? Can you show me what my money's going towards? And I'm not a, and I'll say this, I'm not a big fan of, oh, people say, I want to know where every single dollar my taxes go to. It's like, you know what? That's a lot to keep up with. If you get taxed thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year, you're not going to be able to track every single dollar and whether of all your taxes are going towards fixing the roads or fixing climate change or feeding. There's like, no, because everyone always mad because, oh, unemployment and homeless people and all my money's going towards them. It's like, okay, well, that's charity, except you want the credit for charity. Hence, but I do feel like if, if, if I'm going to be, you know, tax and taxes, you would like to see improvement in your immediate area. Like, you know, if you live in a very lower uh, than desire, a less than desirable area, you would like to say like, hey, all my taxes are going towards all this. How come I've seen no improvement in how the lawn looks at 
child services because it was a common trip in certain areas. It's a lot of child services issues. Um, it's crazy how we have to have a child services area because people apparently don't want to service their child. It's crazy, but what the fuck do I know? Um, but yeah, anyways, moving on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that dollar bill. I kept it. You know what I did with that dollar bill? I spent it. I spent it on an iced coffee. That was $3.17. So I still had to pay $2.17 on my card. But hey, you save money where you can. I guess you could say, I'm charity. And all your taxes contributed to my iced coffee today. You're welcome. Got six pages done. Your boy is uh, actually 167 pages into his script. Seems like I went way past the marker and I'm going to have to delete. Or not delete, but I'm definitely going to have to cut out a good portion of it whenever it will get made one day. Because um, typically it's a minute per page. Now this pace, it might hit 200. And no one's going to watch me do three hours of anything. I don't expect myself to do three hours of anything. No human being should actually be required to do three hours of anything consecutively. But I will say this about movies. I do think how we perceive a movie is based off its runtime a lot, right? If I see a movie that is two hours or longer, automatically, I am going to assume if a movie is two hours or longer, this is going to be a well thought out movie. It's going to have a lot of heavy themes. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to be very well thought out. It's going to be very well written, well acted. It's going to be fairly, I wouldn't even say high budget, but it's going to be high, high value. Kevin Samuel style. It's going to be definitely high quality, right? And it's funny how the difference between seeing the runtime of two hours of a movie and an hour 56 minutes can be the whole difference of how your expectations are going in. Because if I'm going to spend two hours watching something, of course you're going to want the payoff, right? You're not going to watch reasonably. You're not going to watch two hours of something that you don't have some type of prior knowledge of or is not a critically acclaimed movie. And also, you notice how typically the best movies of all time, the ones that are at least widely perceived, are always like two hours and 20 minutes or longer. The Dark Knight. Uh, the social network over the past decade, even though that's actually on the shorter end, that's like two hours and two hours and one minute. And that's with the credits involved, which is kind of insane. Um, the Godfather's over two hours. Most of Quentin Tarantino's better films are over two hours. Typically when the higher, the critically acclaimed the movie is, the longer the movie is because typically it takes longer to tell a decent more quality in depth story and then you get these bullshit netflix shit where it's like an hour 19 minutes and it is just some rush through garbage about vampires you know eating the shit out of a 15 year old type of shit or these cyber movies like oh my god what is this email i got oh my god and the next thing you know your whole room goes dark and then all of a sudden, it's basically follow destination. And all your friends die because you all bullied an individual who got killed. Based off, and then she's coming back and killing all you motherfuckers. Because you guys are bullying ass motherfuckers. That's very specific to a movie. I forgot the name of the movie, but it's a bullshit Netflix movie. But there is credibility. When you see a movie that's two hours plus, your expectation is going to be different than an hour and 56 minutes. It's crazy how that four minutes, just seeing that two. And God, once you get into three hours, it better be some historical next level shit. Like Avatar, where 
Avatar is not one of my favorite movies, but it's obviously insanely adventurous. A lot of fucking money was put into that shit. Titanic, one of those longer ass movies. And like the difference, the expectations of going in to see a movie, Poseidon or Titanic. Virtually very similar, literally both based off true stories. Literally both are sinking ships. Maybe for different reasons, but they're sinking ships. Um, I don't like that battleship with Rihanna. Oh, Jesus. That movie takes work, 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 work to actually watch. Oh, Jesus. How come Drake's never actually been in a movie? That's actually kind of crazy. Typically, rap stars find ways of making movies. 50 Cent, Get Rich or Die Trying. T.I. did in Roll Bounce, Takers. He's done a few other movies. He's been pretty active in movies. Like, high, high, Snoop Dogg's been in movies. High profile rappers typically find a way to make it in movies. It's crazy that J. Cole and Drake have never made it. Kendrick, I, I, I guess it's mainly just current rap artists don't really make it of that level. It's almost like they got something to lose to be in movies. It seems like when you make a certain level as a musician, it seems that being in movies and showing any possible acting or persona outside of outside of your persona as a musician that you lay out in your music, if you're pretending to be something else, it kills that whole persona. It's almost like you have to commit to this whole different life and it's all about your image and all that shit. And obviously, I know Drake was in Degrassi, but that was before he got big, blah, blah, blah. Degrassi was kind of a big show, but it wasn't really that big. It's more of, if Drake wasn't a part of that show, it would not be even replayed on TV. Um, uh, But Jimmy, oh, Jimmy Buckets, more like Jimmy for debt. Um, But it's kind of weird, because you'll see like, I don't even like to use the term mid-level, but the ones that aren't on that level, like the Kyle dude, I Spy, it's like, yeah, I if I was playing I Spy with you, I would fucking spy um, to fucking kill you in your voice. You have the most obnoxious voice ever, and this comes from a person with a very obnoxious voice, but anyways, but yeah, um... Yeah, I'm just going to move on from that one. I don't know where that one was going. But, yeah. Um, oh. Uh, oh, yeah, movies. I'm not a film buff. I actually think... I, I do have this... Um, I do have this theory. I feel people... That are so obsessed with the history of a specific art form, right? Like, people that are obsessed with the history of movies. I don't think... And they're always the ones that are critical of every little thing. Or even TV history. It's like when people were shitting on Game of Thrones. I've never seen Game of Thrones, right? I'm aware, though, of the epic... um, preposterous uh direction that people have of hatred towards the last season of game of thrones because they always say oh it was so poorly written it's like you know what who the fuck are you decide was poorly written it's such a generic bullshit thing to say right May- look maybe it wasn't good it probably wasn't there's a story i don't know how a starbucks cup gets on that like, you you guys have all the money in post editing in the world. They literally were gonna give you a blank check, and you're like, we don't want that blank check. It's like, yeah, you know what? Economically, that sounds like a fucking idiot. I was actually listening to Ben Affleck, uh, interview earlier, and he was talking about how sometimes people get too uh precious about being the one that says, I turned down this offer. I turn. It's like. He's like, early in my career, you know, I was making smaller movies and stuff, and I was making like 20000 to do a movie for four months, which, you know, obviously isn't bad, bad money, but he's like, then when things started to pick up, I got offered $10 million for a movie, then I started getting $8 million, blah, 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 
and he 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 was contemplating. Everyone's telling him like, "You need to be more careful." Too. He's like, "You know how irresponsible I would be to turn down a ten million dollar movie offer, an eight million dollar, seven million dollar to be in a movie at that point in my career." And guess who doesn't have to deal with having to turn down 10, 10, 8, or 7 million? You motherfuckers who would tell them, oh, he picked a bad project. It's like, you know what? I'll be in a shitty movie for 7 fucking million in quote unquote room. I don't understand how being in one bad movie ruins your career. Like, every every good actor, every good director. Well, maybe not director. Because if you're writing the shit, like... If you're really good, typically you don't really have bad movies. You may have bad movies that aren't preference, preferred by some of your fans, but they're not bad by any means. If you're a great director, it's really hard. Like, you almost can't even make a bad movie at a certain point because everyone will always assume that your vision and what you did was something they couldn't comprehend, even if it doesn't make sense, and it legitimately doesn't make sense. Like, Quentin Tarantino couldn't make a bad film if he tried. Because even, he could put out the biggest horse shit and he knows it as an experiment. Quentin Tarantino could attach his name to something that he did not make or nothing. Some 12-year-old could have made it. And you know what dudes that will swallow his load will always say? Oh, you know what? I see what he did there. Oh, the way he did that character develop. They start throwing those bullshit terms out that they know nothing about. Oh, that character development was beautiful. It's like, the duck fucked a pig. Yeah, but you gotta understand, the reason why the duck fucked the pig was because you don't duck the police. Ha ha ha. It's like, go fuck yourself. And... Just because his name's attached, people will always give the benefit of the doubt. Right? Like, personally, I'm not a big Kill Bill fan. I don't, like... But it's a Quentin Tarantino film, so stylistically, and the appeal to entertainment value, obviously it's going to be good, even when I think the story's actually meh, personally. And I'm not this, oh my god, the story's... It's like, I'm not that deep into that. But people that are so obsessed... With critiquing movies and critiquing every little thing that's written and done. I don't get it. And maybe it's just the process of actually going through this. It's like, obviously I put pressure on myself. I make sure to really re-re-read my stuff and really compact it and better and stuff like that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, people assume if a movie is bad, it's because it was badly written. When there's a lot of badly quote-unquote written films that are actually good, they're just lazy. But because of the subject matter, it's not really quote-unquote necessary. Or because of the subject matter and who's in it, it doesn't really affect it that much, right? But uh, anytime I hear someone say it's badly written, I'm just going to ask you, what is? What about it? What about exactly what you're bitching about is badly written? And if you can't even give me a generic fucking answer, and you're just like, it's just badly written. I don't know how to explain it, it just is. It's like, no, you know what, name, name a line. No, name two lines that are badly written. And what would you have done? What, what, what would have fitted your perfect mind that would have made it greatly written? No, seriously. Like, if I hear one more fucking time from these history motherfuckers, and I don't mean actual history, like historical, like Leonard Maltin or Roger Ebert and critics and shit like that. I mean these fucking asswipes that want to critique every little thing and assume that every film sucks and everything sucks, everything's not good, and they nitpick this, that, and the other. And I don't mean like... A movie review fucking podcast. Like I believe the rewatchables. I know I'm getting deep into bullshit no one cares about. But the rewatchables podcast. They review movies and stuff. But it's not just they're sitting there reviewing the movie. Saying this sucks not good. They actually break it down with a combination of analysis. People who are very good at referencing detail. Using outside things to connect stuff. 
opinions, analysis, and research behind it. Like, they actually do a really deep produce with Bill Simmons, and they typically have other guests, various guests, to do specific movies and stuff, right? But they have categories, they break it down, it's fair. It's not just going in there, kissing a movie's ass. It's also not just going in there, uh, you know, shitting on it, even with flaws. But when you see people out here, but like other movie podcasts, review places, or just people that review movies, and they just say generic shit. You know, if you just want to say you don't like a movie and you don't have a breakdown, I respect that so much more. I don't care if you have a breakdown. But if you're going to do breakdown, stop regurgitating bullshit that you don't even know what the fuck it means. Why don't you develop... A pair of testes without a bump in it. And then you could talk to me. By the way, I missed my x-ray. Is it x-ray ultrasound? I don't know. I woke up late. And they had the audacity to send me an email. Be like, hey. How was your visit? I didn't fucking go. And you guys didn't even call me to make sure like, hey, are you alive? It's not really your job. But. Don't send me a fucking survey. How is my visit? It's like, well, since I didn't visit, zero out of five. We saw you gave us a zero out of five. What went wrong? It's like, oh, well, glad you asked. Someone took a fallopian tube up my ass and uh, said, oh, sorry, your name's not Felipe. Yeah, since you're here, you want to get a colonoscopy? It's like, not really. Huh? Well, it's already halfway gone. Oh, uh, Jesus. That's not a life house you want to die on. But anyways... Um, yeah. Shut up with your character development. Shut up with your poorly written. I I don't really care to hear it. No one cares. You want to nitpick flaws in a story? I don't fucking care. Go read a book, you lazy fucks. Stop bitching. Yeah, also, stop bitching about because it's not like the movie. Or, it's not... The movie's not like the book. Yeah, you know what? Because... Restricted time. And honestly, the book, sometimes in books, things are in there to extended effect to explain things. But when you see some visually, certain things don't have to be over explained. Hey, there's one reason why books are not always like the movie. Of course, there's cases where they, where if they would actually use the important parts in a book to enhance the movie, of course it would have. But, if you have a fucking problem with it, just don't watch movies that are based on books. If the book is so goddamn precious to you. People always say, oh, the book, yeah, but the book is so much better. Is it? Really? Because it just seems like a whole lot of someone talking to themselves about absolutely nothing. And you have to be explained for four fucking pages of what they're thinking. Instead of just watching a 30 second scene and you can sense their body language. And sense how they deal with the waitress. Of how they're really feeling. And you don't have to fill in the blanks. It's pretty self-explanatory. So you know what? There's good and bad to everything. But stop bitching about things that are not fucking ideal. How about that? Jesus. Like the fucking notebook. The fucking notebook is based off a book. Ironically. Take notes. Haha, <laughs> fuck you. I never read the notebook, but I remember when it was a thing in school, it was like, well, it came out in 2004, but it became like really a hot topic, like 2009, 2010, when the ladies were actually old enough to, at school, talk about it and shit, and read the book, they're like, oh my god, the book, the book is just for Uh, the book is really just all about the one scene where they fall in love and all this shit. The book actually explains that their love is so much deeper and their flaws. It really describes their relationship. It's like, or crazy thought, the 70 pages to explain it. I would rather just see five minutes of it. A. It's like, yeah, but you have such a deeper understanding. It's like, do you? Or do you just have a lot of unnecessary fluff information, which is what books are for? There's the break it downs. And by the way, I'm an over detailed person. 
I, I love that books do that. I think that's what books are supposed to be supposed to fill your time up and understand a more specific version because there's no body language. Because I can read a book and my neighbor can read a, the same exact book. And the way we picture the scene by scene in our head can be night and day even though we are reading the same fucking words. You know what can't happen at a movie? There's no misinterpretation. I can see what Ryan Gosling looks like. He can see what Ryan Gosling looks like. It's like, yeah, this doesn't seem like uh, it's going to be up our wheelhouse. But you know what? When you're reading a book, you can imagine that you're Ryan Gosling. And you can fill in the blanks. It could be like a deep fake. It could be Photoshop. Just Photoshop yourself. And they say, he's 6'2", 225. And you look down like, yeah, I'm 225. Six one, ah oh, shit. Now I look completely different, but hey, you know what? Meet you halfway, six one and a half, and I look like Ryan Gosling. But crazy, stupid love, right? <laughs> oh fuck you. Anyways, but yeah, that's the beauty. Get over it. I don't care if there's missing plot points. I don't care that oh. Well, in the book, the mom was such a more... And, and I'm not talking about the notebook here. But they'll say, oh, in, in the book of this blah, blah, blah movie, the mom was so much more prevalent. The mom was the reason why he took the trip to Texas and then fell in love with the next girl who reminded him of his mom who died of cancer. His mom was such a prevalent factor. The whole first half of the first book is dedicated to that. It's like... Yeah, you know what? In the movie, they're probably going to summarize it in two minutes. So you're caught up to date. Mom died of cancer. He moved. He's moving to Texas. And we're going to start with the love story. Because you know what? I, sorry to hear this. In movies, no one wants to watch them. No one wants to watch an old lady in a deathbed in hospice for 45 minutes. It's like we know the inevitable. We're here to watch this man fall in love after heartbreak. But hey, what the fuck do I know? I don't read books. See, that's called story development. I did all that fucking ranting and you just found out I don't even read fucking books like that. I'm a very complicated individual. I got a lot of complications inside me. Some, some about guy to me. Everyone's got their hands out, but it ain't to reach me. That's that's like one of the most underrated lines by Drake. And I doubt he even, I'm pretty sure that has been said. That was probably said in a movie in 1982. That most people don't reference off the top of your head. But this man said, everyone's got their hands out, but it ain't to reach me. And I'm like, oh, oh. I actually I think that's off the BB King freestyle, one of the most underrated freestyle or most underrated rap verses of his in general. Him and Lil Wayne, it's like the fact that that's not like this state of the art. Like to me, that freestyle, that rap should be on the level of zero to one hundred and back to back. Somehow this turned into a Drake. To somehow I ended up talking about Drake. Do right and kill everything. And I definitely killed this podcast a long, long time ago. But we are so far gone from that. Oh, Jesus. But yeah. Um, moral of the story is, no one gives a fuck. No one gives a fuck about if your book, your precious, oh, your oh so precious book. And to come in here and talk about, well, they're doing the author a disservice. It's like... You know what, when the author gets that $15, $20 million check, he's like, and he's watching the film and he hates it. Like, God, the inaccuracies in this. Ah, oh, it's egregious. They fucked up the whole character demeanor. He's supposed to be an asshole. They made him somewhat likable. Because if he's somewhat likable, the audience will blow. And then he gets his check the next month. Hey. Here's a $12 million just for the rights to the book and killed at the box office. And then you know what you're saying when you do an interview, when they ask you about, you know, what is it like to have your 
book adapt. Oh, it's fucking great. Oh, you know, the director, they did, oh, the studio, they did a great job. I was so entwined. They didn't change anything. It's like, well, actually, a lot of your fans are saying they really fucked up the character. Well, it's like, you know what? See, um, actually, the character is supposed to be, uh, he's actually deep down what you see in the movie. They actually really capture it well because deep down, he's actually a little bit more likable than I made him to be. Man, money talks, shit walks, and especially when there's one dollar bills. <laughs> oh, I'm the one to say fuck you. Uh, but yeah. Uh. All right, I guess I gotta end this podcast with some unwarranted wisdom. All right, what's my unwarranted wisdom today? Okay, let me think of some bullshit saying that means very little or it's basic self-help nonsense. Okay. When you bottle it up, when you bottle it all up, there will be a message in it for someone else to interpret. Is that what you want? When you bottle it all up, there will be a message for someone else to interpret. Is that what you want? Yes, I just did. Let me just repeat the question because I'm literally asking myself out loud and make it seem like, "Mm, if someone says it twice, it must be something went over my head. It's like, actually, no. Just because you say something twice, I caught it the first time. 98% of the time, I caught it the first time. And if I didn't catch it the first time, even when you say it a second time, I'm going to be like, eh, you just moved the words around and reversed it, and it meant something. You can literally reverse words around, and it make it mean something, but whatever. That's what I do for a living. Anyways, um, but yeah. When you do that, do you want your message to be clear? Or like a book, open to interpretation. Now, but, we're always taught, reading will make you smart. Reading will make you a better writer. Reading will make you a more well-rounded individual. Even if it's fiction, non-fiction, it will just make you smarter. So maybe... If people interpret your message for not what it is, but based off the places it can take it, that is much more impactful than the actual truth. Did I just tell you that it's okay to make little white lies? Absolutely. It's not that the truth isn't necessary. It's the fact that the truth isn't always necessary. Wow. Deep stuff. I literally just said the same thing, but said it in a different tone, so it meant, mm, mm. Talk about isms. This boy's killing it. But, uh, sometimes telling someone the definitions, telling someone Exactly what you mean will not stick with them. Sayings that are unfinished will make them repeat to themselves thoroughly throughout the day, throughout the week. It could be years from now. And then when they are ready to answer that themselves for what it means to them, that's when you will have a long-standing impact. When you let people finish your sentences and not finish theirs, because nothing's a bigger turnoff than when someone tells you what you should feel. But nothing's a bigger turn on than when I give you the option to feel what I feel. Oh, Clint, you are on a roll right now, bullshitting. Bullshitting your way through this wisdom. Dude, I should write a bullshit wisdom book that's like heavily satirical. And just make you feel like 
And just to prove a point, kind of like a Quentin Tarantino film, if you attach your name to some, people always give you the benefit of doubt. Like, wow, he gets some, I don't. But you know what? If some guy at the bar, after having four shots of bourbon, was telling you this shit, you'd think, like, man, this guy's going through it. But I put it in a book, and it's like, hmm, this guy's going through it with me. I'm not even going through this, but I feel like I should just to feel alive because I want to be on the same wavelength as this guy. And then you tip over like Poseidon because the wavelength was seismic. And I'm going to end episode 92 on that seismic graph, which I believe that's actually for earthquakes. Shake, 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 shake it. Oh, Jesus. San Andreas. Oh. Imagine committing Grand Theft Auto when the San Andreas fault line happens. Let's just say, hopefully you don't fall in between the cracks like the rest of society. That got dark. Alright, this is episode 92 of the Off and Beat Podcast. Remember to like, subscribe, and suck some titties. Enjoy your Friday podcast. Um, Yeah, not the most funny podcast, but you know. Little nuggets of wisdom. We talk about uh, ch- charitable. Are they frauds? Are you an ego for one? And are you a narcissist for actually wanting to give back? It's kind of fucked up. Uh, movie buffs and histories. Shut the fuck up. I don't care about your character development. The movies are always more convenient. And it may not tell all the right details. But you know what it does? It gets me the gist. And it's weird how teachers would purse... Ab- I'm about to go on another rant. A little bit. Then I'm going to end it. It's weird how these fucking teachers... With these books made into movies... And they would give you these book assignments for these books. And they would always say... When you're answering questions or have to do an essay... I'll know if you read... I'll know if you just watched the movie or not. Because they are completely different. They always do that bullshit to you. Don't be lazy. Read the fucking book. It's like, yeah, I don't know. You've given me four other assignments for four different fucking subjects that you're teaching that you're inept as is. And you're like, don't watch the movie. Read this fucking book. It's like, no. There's a visual representation. It's weird. It just, uh, ah, Jesus. And they always try to fucking blame you. Like, how dare you use the most convenient option and time efficiency? How dare you? It's like, you know what? When you go for job interviews, you know what they do? They make you watch a visual tutorial. Because you know what? It's a little bit easier wasting a couple hours watching a visual tutorial for a job that not really useful than reading a 80-page pamphlet of how to ring up a Big Mac. Hey, you know what? Time efficiency. But the fucking audacity of you fucking cunts of teachers. To be there and be like. Oh I'll know if you watch the movie. It's like you damn right. And I hope you do know if I watch the movie. I hope you do know I watch the movie. I fucking. But the fact that you would make an extra emphasis. To purposely pick books. To prove a bigger point to kids. I'm like fuck you. Fuck you. Jesus. They did that with the fucking, the book. Uh, what was it? The Giver? I had a teacher do that shit to me about The Giver. They did it about the Hunger Games. They did it about the Harry, well, I actually never had Harry Potter assignments. But Harry Potter was like the biggest red thing and whatever. But yeah, they would do that. And those lit teachers, those middle elementary who taught them all, like, go fuck yourself when you would do that shit. Not all the time. Not your whole class. But when you do that shit, pick books just to give kids temptation. It's like telling a crack addict, like, hey, I, 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 know, I know we got, like, a whole drawer here, and you have to be here for seven hours here. I got a drawer of crack right there in your cupboard. But don't do it. And if you do it, you ain't shit gonna be a bum they may like if you watch the movie 
that like you were gonna have your scholarship taken away or something. It's like, man, it just seems highly convenient. I don't know. These teachers always want to try to teach you a bigger lesson than what is there to be had. But, hey, what the fuck do I know? All right, guys. Have a great fucking day. God, that got me. Ooh, that got me going. Oh, can I suck your titties? Ooh, look at these biceps. Ooh. Just for the camera. Ooh.